Today, we're going to start on a drive in Hawaii. We're on North Shore, going deeper into the jungle on the North Shore. So we're passing Twin Falls right now. I'm driving through the lush green forests of Maui. Annie Altman, Sam Altman's little sister, is sitting in the passenger seat. You heard from her briefly in the first episode. And I love this because you wouldn't turn here if you didn't know you could turn here. I certainly would not be driving down this if I didn't tell you to. tiny little road. We're taking a tour of the different places Annie has moved around in the last couple years. Driving down dirt roads to look at cabins and houses hidden behind enormous tropical plants. Oh my god, huge Somewhere. monstera. Look at that. They're enormous. <gasps> it's so it's so goofy then and driving jealous. this. I know, because then you see it in someone's office plant and you're like, is that the same thing? For much of the past two years, Annie hasn't been able to afford a stable place to live. The place we just passed is one of the places I stayed at longer term in all of the houselessness. Two months on a newly built with no running water or no electricity house at the far end back of the property. And I think she's an important part of Sam's story. And at the time I had no nowhere to stay and no rent money. Um, cert- like certainly no deposit money and barely enough room, barely enough money for rent. Recently, over the course of just a year, she moved 22 times. That's on average about twice a month. Sometimes she has stayed places for a week at a time, or even just a night or two. Some of them have been illegal rentals without running water. She says she slept on floors in friends' houses. She stayed with strangers when she didn't have another option. The man who lived in the front house messaged me on Instagram, and I stayed in his kid's room the week that they weren't there, and then slept on the floor in the common room the week that the kids were there. I was houseless. I didn't have somewhere to go. I stayed in this cabin with the slanty roof right there oh. for three months. Yeah. How many different places have you lived in that didn't have running water? Maybe five-ish, five or six. I don't know. Meanwhile, like- thousands of miles away in San Francisco, her brother Sam was having a spectacular year in 2023. The success of ChatGPT had launched OpenAI into the stratosphere. Sam was named CEO of the Year by Time magazine. He spent months flying around the globe, talking to world leaders about AI. So without further ado, let's give a big round of applause to our special guest, Sam Altman. It is with great pleasure that I invite on stage Sam Altman. The individual transcends introduction, Mr. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI. Sure, Sam had been positioning himself as a public intellectual for some time. But for a long while, he had merely been Silicon Valley famous. This was a new level of fame. Suddenly, it seemed like Sam Altman was the spokesman for this entire AI boom. On stage, on podcasts, in interviews, people kept turning to Sam for answers. They were asking him what our AI future would hold. In May of that year, he confidently suggested a future where no one is poor. It's an idea he's talked about for years, and the remarks show that his tune hasn't changed despite growing renown and wealth. One thing I think we all could agree on is that we just shouldn't have poverty in the world. So he's saying something like poverty, which is as deeply entrenched as civilization itself, could be fixed in the age of AI. Everyone will have what they need to live including a home. I think we are not that far away from being able to eliminate poverty effectively worldwide, certainly in developed countries. Um, And I think there are things that are 50 years from now will be basic human rights, like healthcare and enough food to eat and a place to to live. I'm confident we're going to get that done. He sounds so sure of himself. How will these changes happen? Sam says that they could come from AI. He's basically saying the technology his company is working on can eliminate poverty. Here he is at a Bloomberg conference in June 2023. I think it'd be good to end poverty. Maybe you think we should stop a technology that can do that. I personally don't. He's even scolding people who say they want to stop or slow down the development of AI by saying that they want to keep people poor. Solving poverty seemed to become part of his personal brand. It's almost a stump speech of sorts. And there's one word he likes to use to encapsulate our bountiful future. 
I think it's how we get to this world of abundance. In a world with the level of abundance, AI and the abundance that comes with that, if we can have abundant and cheap energy and intelligence, that will transform people's lives. It sounds wonderful, almost utopian. But Sam was saying on stage that everyone should have enough money, enough food, everyone should have a place to live, while his own sister was struggling with homelessness. I want to believe Sam's promises about abundance, but Annie's story complicates a lot of the things Sam has projected about the future. You're listening to Foundering. I'm your host, Ellen Hewitt. By the time OpenAI had been around for a few years, its employees began sensing that they were working on something profound. AI was starting to do things even its creators didn't quite understand. And the response divided people. Some people at OpenAI, including Sam, argued that an all-powerful computer intelligence would be good for the world. Some thought it could be very, very bad. These visions were extreme, polarizing, as different as heaven and hell. This period ultimately led up to the release of ChatGPT, which was a defining moment for the company and for the entire AI complex. The two predictions people talked about the most during this time were that AI would either wipe out the human race or completely change the definition of work. The first one is hugely controversial. The second one is less controversial. People will lose jobs, and the economy will have to adapt. I'm going to tell this story in two parts. First, the disputes within OpenAI, the reckoning with what they'd built, and the elevation of Sam as some kind of AI hero. In the second part, we'll hear more from Sam's sister and explore the debate around poverty and what an AI economy might look like. And you'll see exactly how far away Annie's life is from Sam's vision of AI utopia. We'll be right back. Let's pick this story up in 2021. It's about a year and a half before OpenAI launches ChatGPT. And OpenAI's technology had been rapidly gaining new capabilities. This was around the time that OpenAI was building more and more powerful models such as GPT-2 and GPT-3 that could ingest text and spit out ever more human-sounding text. That's my colleague Rachel Metz, who covers AI. They were focused on building increasingly powerful AI models, doing it very rapidly, moving toward this goal that they have long stated of um, creating artificial general intelligence. This rapid progress was good. It was great for Sam, great for the company. But it made some OpenAI employees nervous, even ones very high up. Here's Dario Amade, who at the time was the vice president of research at OpenAI. He's talking on the Logan Bartlett podcast, and he sounds genuinely agitated. So, you know, I really freaked out about this stuff in 2018 or 2019 or so. The first time I looked at GPT-2, I was like, oh my, this is like, this is crazy. This is, you know, there's, there's nothing like, there's nothing like this in the world. Like, it's crazy that this is possible. He looked at what he was helping build at OpenAI, and his overwhelming emotion was fear. Why am I scared? Okay, this thing's going to be powerful. It could destroy us. And like all, all the ones we built so far, like, you know, are at, at pretty decent risk of doing some random shit we don't understand. If such a model wanted to wreak havoc and destroy humanity or whatever, I, I think we have basically no ability to stop it. That's from a tech show called The Dorkesh Podcast. You can hear Dario's uneasiness, which spread to some of his peers at work. In 2021, he and six of his OpenAI colleagues all left at once, and they started a new rival company focused on building AI that was safe. We need to make these models safe in a certain way, and you know we need to do them within an organization where we can really believe that these principles are incorporated top to bottom. While his tone sounds innocuous, if you read between the lines, He's implying that OpenAI was not that concerned with safety and not following those principles top to bottom. He and his co-founders felt they needed to create a whole new company focused on preventing AI from potentially wiping us all out. This idea was baked into their name, Anthropic, 
which refers to the existence of humanity on Earth. Anthropic's split from OpenAI was a big deal. The group of employees who walked away included executives and key people who had worked there for a long time. It cast this suspicious pall over OpenAI. Their exit suggested that they didn't trust Sam to do the right thing. So fast forward to late 2022. OpenAI released ChatGPT. They weren't expecting a huge response, but it drew people in. Gradually, then suddenly, everyone was trying it out. Here's Rachel again. I kept an eye on it for a few days, and I started noticing people were talking about it. But it started getting more and more traction. And I remember reaching out to my editors and saying, hey, we should write about this. ChatGPT wasn't new technology. It was basically powered by GPT 3.5, a pre-existing model. But it was a new way of presenting that technology to the world. It was a free, easy-to-use, chat-based AI tool. It felt a little like texting a friend. This was much more fluid feeling. It gave you a sense that you were communicating with a person, a person that would make a lot of things up, right? Um, that whose answers you would have to constantly check. And people were hooked. ChatGPT reached 100 million users in just two months, the fastest growth ever at the time. For reference, it took TikTok nine months and Instagram two and a half years to reach the same popularity. ChatGPT felt intelligent, even when it got things wrong. It prompted a lot of people to ask themselves, how is AI going to change my life? The technology had some immediate practical uses. People started using ChatGPT to write code more quickly, to translate documents more fluidly, and to draft emails. Students used it for homework help, good, and to cheat on papers, not so good. Needless to say, all this excitement was a huge boost for OpenAI. With ChatGPT, OpenAI basically skyrocketed to brand awareness and success, and people immediately started thinking of it as the hot AI company, um, a leader in AI. It also skyrocketed Sam's public profile. Now AI was the story of 2023, and Sam was the main character. He became a household name. And across the tech industry, investors were desperate to throw money at AI. Companies pivoted their focus to AI, and highway billboards touted new AI startups. And this chat GPT mania did something else, too. In addition to making all kinds of people interested in and aware of cutting-edge AI, the release of ChatGPT inflamed this small subsection of people that have long been interested in this idea that AI is going to become more and more powerful and that it will inevitably go rogue and threaten us. And we have to figure out how to save humanity from it fear of AI destroying the world. It's the fear that Dario described feeling before he quit OpenAI to found Anthropic. It might sound a little ridiculous, but to many people, it's dead serious. This Silicon Valley subculture that believes AI might destroy us soon has steadily been growing more influential and powerful. These ideas are a major motivating force in AI right now. Many tech workers in AI feel that they are working on the most consequential thing possible for the human race, a matter of life and death for the whole planet. This belief influences where billions of dollars are directed and which problems get worked on and which ones get ignored. ChatGPT brought these fears into the public consciousness big time. One survey in the UK shows that in the course of one year, right after ChatGPT's release, the percentage of people who believed that AI was a top possible cause of human extinction more than doubled. To be clear, this claim is hotly disputed. A lot of people, even in Silicon Valley, think AI doomerism is overblown or a quasi-religious ideology. 
but many take it seriously. We'll be right back. I want to talk about how it feels to believe AI might destroy humanity. Here's Chao Chu Yuan. He's just one of many people in tech who held this belief. His introduction to this world was, bizarrely, through Harry Potter fan fiction he found online that was written by a very influential AI doomer named Eliezer Yudkowsky. That discovery led him to lots more of Eliezer's writing about AI. He eventually became convinced that the world was probably going to be swallowed by superintelligent AI soon. I was like, okay, it's happening. We're getting there. It's, ha- it's going to happen in my lifetime. It's going to happen like before I retire. Um, I made a conscious decision around this time to not open a retirement account, which some people might think was silly, but I was like, I really do not think money is going to matter <laughs> by the time I hit retirement age. Like, I, I, I think by the time I hit retirement age, the world is going to be unrecognizably strange. I just don't think money is going to be a thing. <laughs> Either we're all going to be dead or we're going to be in this some crazy post-singularity environment where it's just, I just don't think it's going to matter. The singularity is the point when robots become smarter than humans. For him, it went beyond skipping out on a retirement account. Once Chao Chu really started believing this, other things in his life just didn't seem to matter. He dropped out of his math PhD program five years in. He drifted away from old friends. He thought they didn't understand the magnitude of the situation. It was like this black hole in my kind of sense of in which things were important. And like sort of the closer I got to it, like the less important everything else seemed. I was like, oh, well, there's this other stuff that doesn't really matter. There's this other stuff that doesn't really matter. And this is like maybe the only thing that matters. I know this sounds scary, extreme, and maybe ridiculous. But if you spend enough time talking to people in AI and around Silicon Valley, you will hear this attitude. Sometimes it's whispered. Sometimes it's said loudly. Sometimes they'll use terms like AI safety, AI alignment, or AI existential risk. But they're all talking about the same thing. There are significant numbers of influential people in AI who believe that our world in 20 years will be utterly unrecognizable from the world of today. Some people think it'll be way better, but a lot think it might be way worse. And they feel that they should devote their lives to preventing AI doomsday. In the last five or 10 years, a lot of famous, rich tech people have thrown money at this new cause. Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskovitz and crypto fraudster Sam Bankman-Fried each pledged hundreds of millions of dollars toward AI safety projects. Tech leaders have signed public statements about how AI could put our human civilization at risk. Chao Chu and his fellow adherents felt it was deeply important to get other people to accept this threat. They became evangelists. At events, they would trap people in long conversations about AI apocalypse. And they started off skeptical and then they ended up somewhere between like either like really convinced or like scared of just like, oh, oh, this is terrifying. This is like really like I'm like kind of up about this. This is a very frightening idea. It's like, oh, what if everyone dies in 10 years? That's a scary idea. And like it's 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 sort of safer psychologically to just dismiss it as like that's ridiculous. That can never happen. But if someone really like gets gets to you about that, if like if someone you know spends four hours talking to you and very carefully convincing you, like, what if it's possible though? Like that's really that's very scary. That's like, oh, that how do I oh like that's like terrifying. Like, what do I do about that? There's a world of difference between like reflexively dismissing that idea and like really considering it seriously as a possibility on an emotional level. Chao Chu took jobs at AI safety organizations. He volunteered at rationality workshops to try to get more young minds working on AI safety. In this world, when people talk about what's at stake, it's on a galactic scale. Okay, so that's one point of view, that the most important thing right now is to make sure AI is safe in the future. But there are some really smart people, academics and researchers, who find this AI doomsday frenzy very frustrating and harmful. 
like Emily Bender, an academic who specializes in computational linguistics. It's a distraction because there's all kinds of harms that are happening right now in terms of labor exploitation, in terms of data theft, in terms of discriminative outcomes, in terms of um, representational harms. And the more we focus on these very um, sort of you know, exciting in the way that action movies are exciting, fantasy scenarios of existential risk, the less time and effort goes in to actually dealing with the real harms that are happening right now. Emily and lots of other experts argue that all of this talk of AI doomsday is an enormous, dangerous distraction, like a big flashing alarm screaming, we're all going to die. It steals all the air in the room. It makes it easy to ignore issues happening today, like racial bias in AI systems used in criminal justice, stealing copyrighted work of artists to train models, and so many more. Um, you've got the surveillance applications of these technologies that are being used um, to over-police communities for performance of facial recognition technology, mm -hmm. especially for women with darker skin, mm -hmm. in particular Google, and putting identity terms up for sale. If you search for black girls, you get a whole bunch of porn. There's enormous risks around synthetic media. All of our ability to find trustworthy information and then trust it when we find it is threatened. Public health, democracy, right? The list goes on and on. Emily reminds us that these are urgent problems, ways that people are being harmed by AI right now. And yet we are wasting our time talking about these fantasy scenarios because the people with all the money decided to get worried about it. In the meantime, there's a, the, the doomer stuff, the existential risk stuff is also another kind of AI hype. Because if these systems are so powerful, they might destroy the world then these systems are really powerful. I think that hype is a key part of this because a super powerful AI system, that's exciting to investors and to employees. Emily thinks AI apocalypse beliefs are harmful and misleading, but she also thinks many of the people concerned with AI safety are coming from a sincere place. But it does seem to be a genuine belief of some of these folks, the people who get deep into this set of beliefs about um, super intelligent AI taking over the world, see themselves as the, the heroes in their stories who are going to work to stop that. Like, I think it's genuine. I think it's misplaced, but I think it's genuine. I think Emily is hitting on something real here, that this urge to be a hero becomes a motivating force in the AI industry. Here's Chao Chu again. There is this kind of very boyish desire to like be a hero. Like most people don't get a chance to do that in any meaningful sense. Like it, not only just what if I could be a hero, but like, oh, what if I could like smart my way to being a hero? I think it, it'll be difficult for some people to admit this because it's like kind of, uh, it feels immature or something, but I really do think that is part of the, of the appeal of the pitch. Being a hero by using your brain. Chao Chu is saying the quiet part out loud that many people in this field are motivated by this pride. They want to feel like they're important and that their work is cosmically significant. People want to feel like they made a difference. Like people want to feel like their lives matter. And that's, that's a huge part of the hook. It's like, what if this is like the most significant era of human history that there ever has been? And like the choices we make now are going to like reverberate into the future. You know, like people on Twitter who've started like getting really into this stuff will use this like very hyperbolic language like oh yeah we're gonna like conquer the stars you know we're gonna like go create a galactic civilization like i think some people think that those guys are exaggerating and joking like i think they should be taken exactly at face value like literally that's what people think the stakes are believing that this is the most significant era in human history because of what we're building with ai you know who that sounds like sam in speech after speech over the years, he has said that the AI we're working on now is going to be historically significant. Here he is with my colleague Emily Chang. I think we have an opportunity that comes along only every couple of centuries to redo the socioeconomic contract and how we include everybody in that, make everybody a winner, and how we don't destroy ourselves in the process is a huge question. You know, what does it mean to build something that is more capable than ourselves? Like, what does that say about our humanity? What's that world going to look like? What's our place in that world? How is that going to be equitably shared? How do we make sure that it's not like a handful of people in San Francisco making the decisions and reaping all the benefits? 
He says that the AI being built now will reshape the world, our humanity, our social contract. His words are brimming with the heroism that Emily and Chao Chu are pointing out. It's pretty common for people in tech to think they are uniquely smart enough to fix big, hairy problems, like the tech billionaires who are creating a new city near San Francisco, or the entire crypto industry, which thinks it has invented a superior financial system. Maybe Sam sees himself as a hero, and he understands the motivating power of a good story. In 2019, he even hired a fiction writer on contract to write for OpenAI for a few months. I ended up basically writing a novella full of short stories, uh, science fiction short stories. That's Patrick House. He's a neuroscientist and an author. He says he has no idea whether OpenAI still uses his novella in any way. But they saw value in commissioning it. Sam Altman is influenced by certain kinds of fiction. A lot of startups are kind of motivated by story. And that this story often comes from science fiction. A powerful story can make your employees work really hard. How do you motivate people? Like, how do you motivate people, especially in the, like, mostly secular San Francisco? Um, Maybe give them a foundational document and an apocalypse myth and, uh, you know, tell them they're averting, averting the end times. And that's a tried and true historically known way to motivate people. All of this made me wonder, does Sam believe that AI might destroy humanity? Honestly, it's hard to tell. His answers have changed over the years. In 2015, he very clearly wrote that he believes advanced AI is, quote, probably the greatest threat to the continued existence of humanity. We heard him say in the past, with a kind of funny tone, I think AI will probably, like, most likely sort of lead to the end of the world. And around that same time in a New Yorker profile, Sam basically said he was a doomsday prepper. He told a reporter that he had stockpiled guns, gold, ammonium, antibiotics, and gas masks from the Israeli Defense Force. He said he has a big patch of land in Big Sur that he can fly to in case the world crumbles. This was really funny to me, and probably to anyone who has visited Big Sur, because the land out there is literally crumbling right now, leading to rock slides, road closures, and difficulty getting food and supplies in and out. Seems like a precarious place for your apocalypse bunker. When another reporter asked him follow-up questions, Sam tried to blow it off. He said that he does this stuff for fun, because it, quote, appeals to little boy survival fantasies. In the years since then, Sam has notably avoided mentioning the Big Sur property or his stockpile of guns. Annie, his sister, says she never saw the property, but that it's in line with what she knows about him. He's big into that. Or was. Uh, Safety, like guns, gold, how to stock up on worst-case scenario apocalyptic movie scene events. My guess would be that he has it and stopped talking about it. Sam is a savvy guy. As his profile has gotten bigger, after he helped build the world's leading AI company, he has stopped saying things like, AI will kill us all. Instead, he talks about how society will be profoundly changed, but overall, it will be for the better. Since his newfound ChatGPT fame, he has shifted toward presenting himself, and by extension, OpenAI, as more middle of the road. Sam is allowed to change his views, but people have also complained to me in private that Sam has a tendency to talk out of both sides of his mouth. He's good at telling people what they want to hear in that moment. So it's not surprising that if it's advantageous for him to seem more moderate, that he would start to sound that way. In any case, he definitely knows how powerful an explosive apocalypse story is. We trigger more easily on dramatic fears than boring ones. Sam says this himself. Here he is speaking at an Airbnb conference in 2015. He's talking about nuclear power, but it's an analogy that maps very clearly onto AI existential risk. And you can hear, again, Sam's undertone of arrogance, pointing out how he's aware of something rational that other people are blind to. People are much more sensitive to sort of, like, theatrical 
extreme risk than they are to sort of like boring, slow plotting risk. Like nuclear energy has had an unbelievable safety record. You know, it's like a thousand or ten thousand times safer than coal. But most people, would they rather live next to a coal plant or a nuclear energy plant? They pick the coal plant all day long. And when they die in 30 years of lung cancer, it doesn't feel as sort of dramatic as dying in a nuclear meltdown. Um, and no, it's true. Like this is this is like the the human risk miscalculation that always happens, right? People always underweight the boring slow stuff and overweight the quick dramatic stuff. People underweight the boring slow stuff, like misinformation, racial bias, and they overweight the big dramatic stuff. That may be why the AI industry has been telling us disaster stories. You've just listened to part one of Heaven and Hell. Listen to part two for the rest of this story. Foundering is hosted by me, Ellen Hewitt. Sean Wen is our executive producer. Rachel Metz contributed reporting to this episode. Molly Nugent is our associate producer. Blake Maples is our audio engineer. Mark Millian, Anne Vandermeer, Seth Fiegerman, Tom Giles, and Molly Schutz are our story editors. We had production help from Jessica Nix and Antonia Mufarec. If you want to binge the whole series right now, go to Bloomberg.com and hit subscribe. Then connect your Bloomberg.com subscription to Apple Podcasts for early access. See you next time.